Streamline English, Destinations by Peter Viney and Bernard Hartley. Published by Oxford University Press, copyright Oxford University Press, 1982. Unit 1, Arrivals. The train now standing at Platform 5 will be the 10.25 to Exeter St. David's, calling at Reading, Pusey, Westbury and Taunton. Excuse me. Mr. Ward? Yes. I'm Charles Archer from Continental Computers. How do you do? How do you do? Thank you for coming to meet us. Not at all. Did you have a good trip? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'd like you to meet Philip Mason. He's our sales manager. How do you do? The train now standing at platform 3 is the 1020 intercity service to Bristol. I haven't seen you for ages. How's things? All right. And you? Fine. How's work? Okay. Do you fancy a coffee? Oh, yes, I'd love one. The train now arriving at platform two is the 912 from Oxford. Hello, Dorothy. Hello, Margaret. How are you? Very well, thanks. And you? I'm fine. How's the family? Well, they're all fine. My car's just outside the station. Shall I take one of your bags? Oh, yes. Thank you. The next train leaving from Platform 9 will be the 1025 intercity service to Plymouth and Penzance. The train will be divided at Plymouth. Passengers for stations to Penzance should take the front six carriages. Good morning. Good morning. Single to Exeter, please. £14.70, please. There you are. Thank you. Um, what time's the next train? 10.25. Thank you. The train now arriving at platform 12 is the 7.10 from Swansea. Trains from Swansea are running approximately 15 minutes late due to maintenance work between Swansea and Cardiff. Hello there. I beg your pardon? Hello. How are you getting on? Fine, thank you. Sorry, do I know you? Yes, it's me, Nick Fowler. Sorry, I don't think I know you. Aren't you Harry Shiner? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were someone else. Unit 2. Is everything ready? This Is Your Life is one of the most popular programs on British and American television. Every week a famous person is invited to a television studio without knowing that he or she will be the subject of the program. The compare meets the person outside the studio and says, This Is Your Life. The person then meets friends and relatives from his or her past and present. Studio 4 is where the program is recorded. The program begins at 8 o'clock. It's 6.45 now, and the director is checking the preparations with his new production assistant. The subject of tonight's show will be an actor, Jason Douglas. The compare, as usual, will be Terry Donovan. Let's just check the arrangements. We're bringing Jason Douglas here in a studio car. He thinks he's coming to a discussion program. The driver has been told to arrive at exactly 7.55. Now, the program begins at 8 o'clock. At that time, Jason will be walking to the studio. Terry Donovan will start his introduction at 8.01, and Jason will arrive at 8.02. Terry will meet him at the studio entrance. Camera 4 will be there. Then he'll take him to that seat. It'll be on camera 3. Jason will be sitting there during the whole program. For most of the show, Terry will be standing in the middle, and he'll be on camera too. The guests will come through that door, talk to Terry and Jason, and then sit over there. Now, is that all clear? 
Yes, there's just one thing. Well, what is it? Who's going to look after the guests during the show? Pauline is. And where will they be waiting during the show? In room 401, as usual. Pauline will be waiting with them, and she'll be watching the show on the monitor. She'll tell them two minutes before they enter. I think that's everything. Unit 3, this is your life. <laughs> Welcome to This Is Your Night. This is Terry Donovan speaking. We're waiting for the subject of tonight's program. He's one of the world's leading actors, and he thinks he's coming here to take part in a discussion program. I can hear him now. Yes, here he is. Jason Douglas, This Is Your Night. Oh, oh, no. I don't believe it. Not me. Yes, you. Now, come over here and sit down. Jason... You were born at number 28 Balaclava Street in East Ham, London, on July the 2nd, 1947. You were one of six children, and your father was a taxi driver. Of course, your name was then Graham Smith. Now, do you know this voice? I remember Jason when he was two. He used to scream and shout all day. Susan! Yes, all the way from Sydney, Australia. She flew here specially for this program. It's your sister, Susan Fraser. Susan! <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> this is wonderful. Yes, you haven't seen each other for 13 years. Take a seat next to him, Susan. You started school at the age of five in 1952, and in 1958, you moved to Lane End Secondary School. Do you remember this voice? Smith, stop looking out of the window. <laughs> oh, no! It's Mr. Hooper! Your English teacher, Mr. Stanley Hooper. It was Jason a good student, Mr. Hooper. Eh? Hey. Oh, he was the worst in the class. But he was a brilliant actor, even in those days. He could imitate all the teachers. Thank you, Mr. Hooper. You can speak to Jason later. Well, you went to the London School of Drama in 1966 and left in 1969. In 1973, you went to Hollywood. Do you know this voice? Hi, Jason. Can you ride a horse yet? Maria! Maria Montrose has come from Hollywood to be with you tonight. Hello, Jason. Oh, it's great to be here. Hello, Terry. Jason and I were in a movie together in 1974. Jason had to learn to ride a horse. Well, Jason doesn't like horses very much. Like them? I'm terrified of them. <laughs> Anyway, he practiced for two weeks. Then he went to the director, it was Charles Orson, and said, What do you want me to do? Charles said, I want you to fall off the horse. Jason was furious. He said, What? Fall off? I've been practicing for two weeks. I could fall off the first day without any practice. Unit 4, the Monte Carlo Rally. The Monte Carlo Rally, which started in 1911, is Europe's most famous motoring event. Competitors leave from several points around Europe and follow routes of approximately equal length to a rallying point, which will be Geneva this year. They then follow a single route to the finish. The rally consists of five daily stages, beginning on Sunday morning, and each competitor will have driven about 3,000 kilometers by Thursday night. It is not a race. The winner is decided on a point system. Drivers have to maintain an average speed between control points, and there are also special tests of driving skill in different conditions on the way. This is Radio Wessex on 203 metres, medium wave. It's 9 o'clock on Monday the 25th of January, and this is Barry King reporting from Dover. The British competitors in the Monte Carlo Rally have just arrived here at the end of the second stage in this year's competition. Russell Cook, who's driving a Sunbeam Lotus, is leading. The triumph, driven by Tony Bond, who won last year's rally, crashed in Yorkshire this morning. Tony was unhurt, but will be unable to continue. Seven other cars have withdrawn due to bad weather conditions. Tonight, the cars which left from Glasgow on Sunday morning will be crossing the English Channel. Unit 5, out of work. In Britain, a lot of people are out of work. Tracy Chapman is 18 and she left school a year ago. She lives in the North East, an area of high youth unemployment. She hasn't been able to find a job yet. 
Me dad just doesn't understand. He started working in a steel mill when he was 15. Things are different now. But he thinks I should start bringing home some money. Oh, I get me unemployment benefit. But that isn't much and I'm fed up with queuing for it every Thursday. I hate having to ask me mum and dad for money. Oh, me mum gives me a couple of pounds for tights now and then. But she can't stand seeing me at home all day. I've almost given up looking for a job. I buy the local paper every day. But I'm really tired of looking through the situation's vacant column. There are 50 applicants for every job. I was interested in being a dentist receptionist because I like meeting people. But now I take any job at all. People ask me why I don't move to London, but I don't want to leave my family and friends. Anyway, I'm scared of living on my own in a big city. George Morley is 54. Until last year, he was a production manager in the textile industry. He had worked for the same company since he left school. He had a good job, a four-bedroom house and a company car. When his company had to close because of economic difficulties, he became redundant. It's funny, really. I don't feel old, but it isn't easy to start looking for a job at my age. I've had so many refusals. Now I'm frightened of applying for a job. All the interviewers are 20 years younger than me. You see, I'm interested in learning a new skill, but nobody wants to train me. I can see their point of view. I'll have to retire in ten years. It's just... Well, I'm tired of sitting around the house. I've worked hard for nearly 40 years, and now I'm terrified of having nothing to do. When I was still with Lancastrian Textiles, I was bored with doing the same thing day after day, but now I'd really enjoy doing a job again. Any job, really. It's not the money. I've got good redundancy pay, and the house is paid for, and I've given up smoking. No, it's not just money. I just need to feel, well, useful. That's all. Unit 7, Battle of Trafalgar Street. This is Pennine Radio News. Alan Nelson reporting from Trafalgar Street. Mr Hardy, the Tadworth Housing Officer, has agreed to speak to us. Now, Mr Hardy, has the situation changed since last night? No, it hasn't. Mrs Hamilton is still there and she's still refusing to talk to us. Well, what are you going to do? It's a very difficult situation. We'd like her to come out peacefully. The police don't intend to prosecute her, but she's a very stubborn lady. Stubborn? Yes, well, it is her home. I agree, and it's been her home for a long time, I know. But nobody else refused to move. You see, a lot of people in this area are living in substandard accommodation, and we're going to build over 300 flats on this site. Families are expecting to move into them next year. It's all being delayed because of one person. But Mrs. Hamilton was born in that house. Of course, of course. But we have promised to give her a modern flat immediately. A very nice flat, which is ideal for an elderly person living alone. So, what happens next? I don't know. I really don't. But we can't wait forever. The police will have to do something soon. It won't be easy. She's got two very big dogs, and they don't like strangers. We have also managed to arrange an interview with Mrs. Hamilton. She has decided to speak to us, but she has demanded to see me alone. Mrs. Hamilton! Who are you? I'm Alan Nelson, Pennine Radio News. Well, don't come any closer or I'll let the dogs out. Down, Caesar. Sit, boy. I'm sure our listeners would like to hear your side of the story. There's not much to say. I'm not moving. I was born here. I had my children here. And I intend to die here. But the council really need to have this land, and they have arranged to provide a new flat for you. Oh, yes, I know. But I can't take my dogs with me, and I need to have company. My dogs are all I've got. Down, boy. How long can you stay here? Oh, I've got plenty of food. The council have threatened to cut off the water and electricity, but I'll be all right. Well, thank you, Mrs. Hamilton, and good luck. And you can tell the council from me 
I want another house where I can keep me dogs. Not a little flat in a bloody high-rise block. Unit 9. Marriage Guidance Council. Malcolm and Barbara Harris have been married for nearly 15 years. They've got two children, Gary, aged 13, and Andrea, who's 11. During the last couple of years, Malcolm and Barbara haven't been very happy. They argue all the time. Barbara's sister advised them to go to the Marriage Guidance Council. There is one in most British towns. It's an organization which allows people to talk with a third person about their problems. This is their third visit, and Mrs. Murray, the counselor, always sees them. Ah, come in, Barbara. Take a seat. Is your husband here? Yes, he's waiting outside. He didn't want to come here this week, but, well, I persuaded him to come. I see. How have things been? Oh, much the same. We still seem to have rows all the time. What do you quarrel about? What don't we quarrel about, you mean? Oh, everything. You see, he's so inconsiderate. Go on. Well, I'll give you an example. You know, when the children started school, I wanted to go back to work again, too. So I got a job. Well, anyway, by the time I've collected Gary and Andrea from school, I only get home about half an hour before Malcolm. Yes. Well, when he gets home, he expects me to run around and get his tea. He never does anything in the house. Mm. And last Friday, he invited three of his friends to come round for a drink. He didn't tell me to expect them, and I'd had a long and difficult day. I don't think that's right, do you? Barbara, I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm here to listen. Sorry. And he's so untidy. He's worse than the kids. I always have to remind him to pick up his clothes. He just throws them on the floor. After all, I'm not his servant. I've got my own career. Actually, I think that's part of the trouble. You see, I earn as much money as he does. Malcolm, I'm so glad you could come. Hello, Mrs. Murray. Well, I'll be honest, Barbara had to force me to come, really. Does it embarrass you to talk about your problems? Yes, it does. But I suppose we need to talk to somebody. Barbara feels that you... Well, you resent her job. I don't know. I would prefer her to stay at home, but she's very well qualified. and I encourage her to go back to work. Now the kids are at school, she needs an interest. And I suppose we need the money. How do you share the housework? I try to help. I always help her to wash up, and I help Gary and Angie to do their homework while she does the dinner. But she doesn't think that's enough. What do you think? I'm not here to give an opinion, Malcolm. I think we're both too tired, that's all. In the evenings, we're both too tired to talk. And Barbara, she never allows me to suggest anything about the house or about the kids. We always have the same arguments. She's got her own opinions, and that's it. Last night, we had another row. She's forbidden the kids to ride their bikes to school. Why? She thinks they're too young to ride in the traffic, but I think they should. She always complains about collecting them from school. But you can't wrap children in cotton wool, can you? Unit 10. A funny thing happened to me. A funny thing happened to me last Friday. I'd gone to London to do some shopping. I wanted to get some Christmas presents and I needed to find some books for my course at college. You see, I'm a student. I caught an early train to London, so by early afternoon I bought everything that I wanted. Anyway, I'm not very fond of London, all the noise and traffic, and I'd made some arrangements for that evening. So I took a taxi to Waterloo Station. I can't really afford taxis, but I wanted to get the 3.30 train. Unfortunately, the taxi got stuck in a traffic jam and by the time I got to Waterloo, the train had just gone. I had to wait an hour for the next one. I bought an evening newspaper, the Standard, and wandered over to the station buffet. At that time of day, it's nearly empty, so I bought a coffee and a packet of biscuits, chocolate biscuits. I'm very fond of chocolate biscuits. There were plenty of empty tables, and I found one near the window. I sat down and began doing the crossword. I always enjoy doing crossword puzzles. After a couple of minutes, a man sat down opposite me. There was nothing special about him, except that he was very tall. In fact, he looked like a typical city businessman. You know, dark suit and briefcase. 
I didn't say anything, and I carried on with my crossword. Suddenly, he reached across the table, opened my packet of biscuits, took one, dipped it into his coffee, and popped it into his mouth. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was too shocked to say anything. Anyway, I didn't want to make a fuss, so I decided to ignore it. I always avoid trouble if I can. I just took a biscuit myself and went back to my crossword. When the man took a second biscuit, I didn't look up and I didn't make a sound. I pretended to be very interested in the puzzle. After a couple of minutes, I casually put out my hand, took the last biscuit and glanced at the man. He was staring at me furiously. I nervously put the biscuit in my mouth and decided to leave. I was ready to get up and go when the man suddenly pushed back his chair, stood up and hurried out of the buffet. I felt very relieved and decided to wait two or three minutes before going myself. I finished my coffee, folded my newspaper and stood up. And there, on the table where my newspaper had been, was my packet of biscuits. Unit 11. Polite Requests. Max Millwall used to be a popular comedian on British radio. He's nearly 70 now, but he still performs in clubs in the Midlands and north of England. He's on stage now at the All Star Variety Club in Wigan. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen and others. It's nice to be back in Wigan again. Well, I have to say that. I say it every night. I said it last night. The only trouble was that I was in Birmingham. <laughs> I thought the audience looked confused. Actually, I remember Wigan very well indeed. Really. You know, the first time I came here was in the 1930s. I was very young and very shy. <laughs> Thank you, Mother. No, you can't believe that, can you? Well, it's true. I was very young and very shy. Anyway, the first Saturday night I was in Wigan, I decided to go to the local dance hall. Remember the old majestic ballroom in Wigan Shore Street? There's a multi-storey car park there now. It was a lovely place, always full of beautiful girls. The ballroom, not the car park. <laughs> of course, most of them are grandmothers now. <laughs> oh, you were there too, were you, love? I was much too shy to ask anyone for a dance. So I sat down at a table and I thought I'd watch for a while. You know, see how the other ladies did it. At the next table, there was a lovely girl in a blue dress. She'd arrived with a friend, but her friend was dancing with someone. This bloke came over to her. He was very posh, wearing a dinner jacket and a bow tie. Well, he walked up to her and said, Excuse me, may I have the pleasure of the next dance? She looked up at him. She had lovely big blue eyes and said, Hey, what did you say? <laughs> so he said, I wonder if you would be kind enough to dance with me. Ah, uh, if you don't mind. Eh, hey, no thank you very much, she replied. A few minutes later, this other chap arrived. He had a blue suit, a nice tie, a little moustache. He gave her this big smile and said, Would you be so kind as to have the next dance with me? Pardon, she said. I thought to myself, she's a bit deaf, or maybe she hasn't washed her ears recently. <laughs> Would you mind having the next dance with me, he said, a bit nervous at this time. Eh, hey, no thanks, love. I'm finishing me lemonade, she replied. Blimey, I thought, this looks a bit difficult. Then this third fella came over. He was very good looking, you know, black teeth, white hair. Sorry, I mean, white teeth, black hair. May I ask you something, he said, ever so politely. If you like, she answered. Can I, I mean, could I, no, might I have the next dance with you? Oh, sorry, she said. My feet are aching, I've been standing up all day at the shop. But now I was terrified, I mean, she said no to all of them. Then this fourth character thought he'd try. Would you like to dance, he said. What? She replied. She was a lovely girl, but I didn't think much of her voice. Do you want to dance, he said. She looked straight at him. No, she said. That's all. No. Well, I decided to go home. I was wearing an old jacket and trousers. And nobody would say that I was good looking. Just as I was walking past her table, she smiled. Uh, dance, I said. Thank you very much, she replied. And that was that. It's our 40th wedding anniversary next month. Mike? Yes? 
Shut the door, will you? It's freezing in here. Right. Sorry. Karen? Yes? Lend me 20p. I'll just need a purse in the office. Oh, OK. Here you are. Thanks. Excuse me, could you pass me the sugar? Oh, yes, uh, of course. There you are. Thank you very much. Can I help you? Oh, thank you. Would you mind putting my case on the rack? Not at all. There they are. Oh, there you are. Oh, thank you so much. You're very kind. Excuse me, it's a bit stuffy in here. Do you mind if I open the window? No, no, I don't mind at all. I feel like some fresh air too. Excuse me, Mrs. Howe, may I ask you something? Yes, Wendy, what is it? May I have the day off next Friday? Well, we're very busy. Is it important? Uh, yes, it is, really. It's my cousin's wedding. Oh, well, of course you can. Can I help you, sir? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon? Can I help you, sir? Oh, no. No, thank you. I'm just uh, looking. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if you can help me. I'm trying to find a Christmas present for my father. Might I suggest a tie? Mm, perhaps. Could you show me some ties? Excuse me. Yes? I wonder if you'd be kind enough to get me one of those tins on the top shelf. I can't reach it. Certainly. <clears throat> there you are. Thank you very much indeed. Unit 12, A Trip to Spain. Norman Gallard is a trainee sales representative. He's 22, and he works for a company that sells toys. He's going to Spain on business. It's his first business trip abroad, and he's packing his suitcase. He lives with his parents, and his mother is helping him and fussing. Norman, haven't you finished packing yet? No, Mum. It's all right. There isn't much to do. Well, I'll give you a hand. Oh, there isn't much room left. Is there anywhere to put your toilet bag? Yes, yes, you'll go in here. Now, I've got three more shirts to pack. They'll go on top. But there's another pair of shoes to get in. I don't know where to put them. Put them down the side. Right, I think we can close it now. Right. Where's the label? Which label, dear? The airline label to put on the suitcase. Ah, here it is. Now, have you got the key? Which key? The key to lock the case, of course. It's in the lock, Mum. Don't fuss. There's nothing to worry about. There's plenty of time. Have you forgotten anything? I hope not. And you've got a safe pocket to keep your passport in. Yes, it's in my inside jacket pocket. Have you got a book to read on the plane? Yes, it's in my briefcase. And has everything been arranged? What do you mean? Well, is there someone to meet you at the other end? Oh, yes. The Spanish representative's meeting me at the airport. And you've got somewhere to stay tonight? I hope so. Now, everything's ready. I'll just have to get some pesetas at the airport. I'll need some small change to tip the porter, but that's all. Well, have a good trip, dear, and look after yourself. Thanks, Mum. Oh, I nearly forgot. Here are some sweets to suck on the plane. You know, when it's coming down. Oh, Mum! Don't worry. I'll be all right, really. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Unit 13, Flying to Spain. This 
is the last call for the 12 o'clock British Airways flight BA412 to Amsterdam. Would passengers for this flight please proceed without delay to gate 17. Scandinavian Airlines announced the departure of the 1205 flight SK526 to Stockholm. This flight is now boarding at gate 8. Would passengers for the 1210 Iberia flight IB341 to Madrid please go at once to gate 16 where this flight is now boarding. Alitalia regret to announce that their 1215 flight AZ281 to Rome will be delayed for approximately 30 minutes. Olympic Airways announced the departure of the 1230 flight OA260 to Athens. Would passengers on this flight please proceed to gate 19. This is a call for Mr. Gaston Meyer. Would Mr. Gaston Meyer, travelling on the 1245 Sabina flight SN604 to Brussels, report to the airport information desk, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Bereth and his crew welcome you aboard Iberia flight IB341 to Madrid. I am sorry to announce a slight delay. We are still waiting for clearance from air traffic control. The delay won't be too long, and we hope to arrive in Madrid on time. This is your captain speaking. We are now passing over the English coast. Our Boeing 727 is cruising at a height of 30,000 feet, and our speed is approximately 560 miles per hour. The temperature in Madrid is 18 degrees Celsius, and it is a clear and sunny day. We expect to pass through some slight turbulence, and would recommend passengers to remain in their seats and keep their belts fastened. Beginning our descent to Madrid, would passengers please make sure that their seatbelts are fastened and extinguish all smoking materials. We would like to remind passengers that smoking is not permitted until you are in the airport building. We hope you had a pleasant and enjoyable flight. We would like to thank you for traveling on Iberia, and we hope to see you again soon. Would passengers please remain seated until the plane has come to a complete stop and the doors have been opened. Here's your tray, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. Would you like something to drink? Uh, yes, please. Some red wine. That's a hundred pesetas. Thanks. Can I pay in British money? Of course. You needn't pay now. I'll collect it later. Spanish national or non-Spanish, sir? Um, I'm British. Would you mind completing this landing card, sir? Right, thank you. Passport, please. Thank you. Where have you come from, sir? London. And what's the purpose of your visit? To business or pleasure? Business. Fine. And how long will you be staying here? Just for five days. Thank you, Mr. Garat. I hope you enjoy your visit. Unit 15. Money, money, money. 
Excuse me? Yes, miss. How much do you want for this plate? Let me see. Oh, yes. That's a lovely example of Victorian brass. It's worth 20 quid. 20 pounds? Well, that's too much for me. It's a pity. It's really nice. Ah, oh, I said it's worth 20 quid. I'm only asking 15 for it. 15 pounds? Yes, it's a real bargain. Oh, I'm sure it is. But I can't afford that. Well, look, just for you, I'll make it 14 quid. I can't go any lower than that. I'll give you 10. 10? Come on, love. You must be joking. I paid more than that for it myself. 14. It's worth every penny. Well, perhaps I could give you 11. 13. That's my final offer. 12. 12.50? All right. 12.50. There you are, love. You've got a real bargain there. Yes. Thank you very much. 